from California, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I <clears throat> find this hearing to be uh, most interesting. And uh, the question of whether or not um, immigrant workers are taking jobs uh, from Americans and African Americans have been mentioned an awful lot here today. And I'm so pleased to hear that so many people are interested in African Americans getting jobs. Uh, I'm also interested in the fact that um, all of a sudden we're hearing discussion about increased wages when one of the biggest struggles we've had in this Congress is increasing the minimum wage. And so this is very enlightening uh, to me as I listen to some of the interest, particularly of some of my colleagues uh, on the opposite side of the aisle. Let me just say this, that of course, there are Americans and African Americans who would work on some of these jobs, but let me just assure you, for uh, the people in my district, this is not a high priority for the kind of job they would like to have. Uh, I imagine uh, very desperate ones uh, would take some of these jobs for a limited period of time uh, if it was, you know, uh, if it concerned their survival. But if I had to support subsidizing corporations to hire workers, I would not put my emphasis on farm labor. I would put my emphasis on construction jobs. For example, in my district, a lot of young people who are not well educated um, ask for and seek out the opportunity to work on construction jobs. We had one program that was uh, laying fiber optics that um, many of the young people who uh, did not have uh, skills learned to do this kind of work. Uh, so whether we're talking about in construction or communications industry where training um, is, is available and possible, uh, I would subsidize employers uh, to bring those, to increase those kind of jobs. I would also subsidize employers to bring jobs from offshore back into the United States uh, where they would be in the inner cities and in the urban areas because this business of talking about transportation from urban areas to rural areas is just unreal. It just, it, it is not something that is workable. So. I'd like to focus a little bit on comprehensive immigration reform because I think that's really um, what we should be talking about. And I'd like to ask um, my friend, Mr. Rodriguez, who I've known for many years and proud to say that uh, I was in the California legislature when Howard Berman led the way on all of the reforms that we did for immigrant workers working with Cesar Chavez, and I think he was one of the most um, profound organizers of our time. Let me ask you, in immigration reform, if we talk about um, allowing citizenship to be made available to farm workers, how would you frame that? Would you say that if you've been here working uh, without papers for four years, five years, two years, three years, 10 years, you should be afforded citizenship. How would you do that? Well, thank you very much, Congressman Waters. In fact, we do have a solution and what the legislation that Mr. Berman and the other member of the Congress, Adam Putnam, have put together and fashioned it to deal with the agricultural industry specifically is that a worker that worked 150 days in agriculture in the previous two years would be allowed to become part of the ag jobs program as we call the legislation. But farm workers would not get automatic legalization as we talked about before. They would be put into a program of earned legalization whereby they would have to continue working in agriculture for the next three to five years. In addition, they would be paying upwards of $500 million overall within the entire group of fines for being here and coming into the country undocumented. And would, let, I, I'll get that. Let me just ask you quickly because I want to get this in on comprehensive sure. immigration reform. Would you support significant fines for employers who break the law? Once we get this settled 
And once we deal with this particular issue, yes, I think there should be an enforcement policy put into place to make sure that we don't have continued uh, immigrants coming in that would violate those laws. Do you think there are some immigrants uh, who should be deported for some reason, whether they're criminals or some if other an, kinds if of reasons? If an immigrant is committed and violated serious laws here within our country, yes, that is a reason for their deportation at this time. And would you support an immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, some way of keeping families together where um, you have uh, undocumented immigrants who have been here for a period of time, children were born here, they are legal, and at some point in time, the mother or father may be faced with deportation. How would you deal with that? The, the gentlelady's time has expired, so we'll ask him to answer. Thank you. Okay. I would support any immigration reform, whether it's comprehensive or ag jobs or the DREAM Act that work to keep families together. That's the, that's the basis of our society, to have families together. Immigrant families want to be together just like any other American family. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we turn now to um, Mr. Lundgren for his five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I just might uh, respond when you said that uh, there is a Democratic caucus rule of a 72-hour notice. Uh, perhaps you ought to inform your leadership since just three weeks ago I received no notice of um, a uh, bill that contained part of a bill I'd introduced to get rid of the 1099 requirement on small business that's in the health care bill. Our leadership was given 10 seconds notice. 10 seconds notice. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, happy if you can give me more than it, 10 seconds. It's not a Democratic caucus rule, it's a House rule and the measure that the gentleman is discussing was actually on the suspension calendar, which is, has a different um, ah, okay. section. So, but so there is an exception to the 72 hour On the hour suspension rule, calendar. So long as you are in command. Which requires a two-thirds vote, as you know, Mr. Chairman. I understand Chairman. that. But let's just make it clear, 10 seconds is not 72 hours, and perhaps you ought to inform your leadership of that uh, rather than the caucus. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Rodriguez this. If you estimate that 75 percent of uh, those working in the fields are here illegally, 25 percent, I presume, are here legally, how are we able to attract that 25 percent since presumably they're subjected to the same price structure and working conditions as the others? Well, it's Thank you very much, Congressman. As, you, uh, as I introduce the individuals that are here, there are a lot, there's tens of thousands of farm workers that are here legally, working here legally, that have been in agriculture for a long time, as the ones that I just introduced to you. And they have been here, they've worked hard, they work with the employers that they enjoy working with, they enjoy the work that they do, and they continue to do so. They have good wages where they work at, they have good benefits, medical plan, pension plan, vacations, paid holidays, like any other American worker here in this country. So, so are, you, are you telling us that the 25 percent that are successfully recruited to the agricultural um, fields are recruited successfully because they get appropriate wages and they get appropriate uh, working conditions? I think that's one factor. In addition to that, the employers that have unauthorized workers working with them also oftentimes want to see those employees continue working with them. They I, I, I realize that, but that's not my question. They value those workers. That's not my question. My question is, I, I'm trying to work this thing out. I'm trying to figure out if your premise is that we don't have people going into the fields because Americans won't take those jobs. You then tell me that 25% of those people in the fields are Americans, and so my question is, how are we able to successfully attract them, and is it different than the conditions and wages available to the other 75? And if that be so, could we attract a larger number of Americans replicating what we do for that 25% that are Americans working in the field? I, I think our solution is realistic right now and practical. Okay. The agricultural industry needs those workers now. They have a, a workforce that they've worked with now for many years. All we're asking is to give them the opportunity to have legal status in this country. I, I understand. And that. then That's not as my a question. result of that, in conditions will improve, wages will improve, the likelihood of American consumers having a good safe food supply will also be okay. secured. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. And I'd like to ask both you and Mr. Glaze, is it an absolute essential to the Ag Jobs Bill that the people who would benefit from it on the worker side 
are allowed to be on the path to citizenship and thereby be put in front of the line of others who follow the law? They are not going to be put in front of the line. Farm workers that would be included under ag jobs would have to work in agriculture for the next, minimally for the next three to five years right. in order to be qualified to even get a green card. They would not get a green card until after they've been able to demonstrate that they've continued to work in, in agriculture for a minimal, for a certain period of time. Okay. And then ask. they'll be able to get a green card, which does not put them in front of the line, just gives them an opportunity then to go and okay, try well, to Let me ask this question. Uh, one of the major sending countries uh, is Mexico. Uh, how long does one have to wait in Mexico if one wants to get in line to get uh, legal entry into the United States and work towards a green card? I have no idea. I don't have any idea because the, the workers that I work with, unfortunately, come in a different Well, but see, that's the question of whether they're in the front of the line or not. If people have to wait longer than three years or five years or eight years or ten years to get in line legally, and you're saying that these folks qualify automatically, they are being put in front of the line. Mr. Glaze, is well, it essential just, to your program? Can I just clarify that one? Well, well, let me just ask Mr. Glaze, is it essential to your program, Mr. Glaze, that they be put on the path towards citizenship as opposed to another type of legal status? The, the gentleman's time has expired, so we'll ask Mr. Glaze to respond. In Congressman Lundgren, let me say thank you very much for your efforts to actually fix this problem. It is essential that these, the workers that are here now be allowed to have work authorization for a period of X number of years. The Ag Jobs contemplates a fixing of the H-2A program, which we've had lots of testimony here stating that let's figure out how to legally bring workers to pick these crops. That is of the utmost importance. In the meantime, I cannot afford to lose a crop one year. Now the status down the road, I think that is a part of our American willingness to accept immigrants in this country. And putting them at the front of the line, I agree with Mr. Rodriguez, no, they don't go to the front of the line. They will have work authorization for a period of years, and then they can seek their citizenship at that time. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you. Then as time has expired, I recognize the uh, gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and um, thank you to all the panelists who are here today. I've heard so many interesting and somewhat, I think, outrageous claims today. I, I kind of don't even know where to begin with some of the questioning, but I just want to start by making an observation.